Uh, if you've not yet put your name into the, uh, the box at the front, please do so, and uh, uh, good luck. Um, I'd like to introduce Mike Daniel, who is um, the Stickley historian. He told me today he's been with Stickley funny? for 45 years this year, which is just amazing. Oh, yeah, and, uh, we, both, we both started. Yeah, right. We did. Right? Absolutely. So, Thanks, Mike. Thanks for the staff. Give us a long round of applause. Thank thanks thanks, thanks uh, for, for uh, among my, my colleagues over here. Uh, these guys brought me out of retirement to come here because I've given up doing these things. Uh, not necessarily because I don't like doing them. It's just that it's just that I thought I had been everywhere, but I've never been here. So I had to check that off now. All right. So I've been here now. Where so am I? So you're retired really now? Yeah, no, no, yeah, after I'm done with this, I'm okay. retired. The, uh, the goal tonight is to give you a chance to experience what has happened at Stickley over the past 44 years. Uh, as I, when I, I started there in 1974, I was 20 years old and just looking for a part-time job because the new owners had bought the company. And that's all it was supposed to be. And ultimately, it's turned into a lifetime career. And my great uncle had been there for many years before. So when I got there, the older guys who were still there knew my great uncle. And I was OK, because I was Jimmy's kid. You see? So that made it all right. So I, was got, I got good jobs. And, and it's really turned out amazingly well. I really just have enjoyed it so, so much. So I put something together on the plane, and I thought that this would be a smorgasbord of a talk. We all know what that is. We're in Wisconsin, right? Isn't this the birthplace of the smorgasbord? Am I missing Probably. something? Probably. Bratwursts, <laughs> just like church suppers? All right. Fish fries. Fish fries. Well, fish fries. All right. Well, this is like a smorgasbord fish fry church supper event. And I hope you, I hope you enjoy it. I'm going to move right along. The, the man who, uh, who uh, saved the company is Alfred Audi, who has passed on now and is a member of the, of the Furniture Makers Hall of Fame, along with his wife, Amini, and the president of our company, their son, uh, uh, um, Edward Audi, uh, who was a little uh, five-year-old twerp who would run around and get our soda bottles after we drank our soda bottles, and he would get the deposit for them. So that was Edward to me, but now he's the boss. But that's okay. I still like him. He's all right. He's a good guy. But because of this family, this, this company saved because it was going down the tube really fast. Phone calls would come in, and people would say things like, um, I got this piece of furniture. And this happened to be a Polaroid image that came in. And Mr. Audi showed it to me. He says, Mike, isn't there some of this stuff in the basement? And I said, sure there is. So, Year, I put that in there, and then years later, I find this picture again, and the phone number's on there. And I called the guy up, and this is me, not too many years ago, going up to the Adirondack Mountains to visit this guy who still had the piece in his garage. So now Mission Oak is starting to kind of emerge as an idea in our heads, you know, in the 1980s. So I come up there, and I see this, and I look at it, and I said, yeah, that, that is a Gustav Stickley uh, uh, chest, uh, and it's got quarter sawn oak. Normally we would see copper hardware on that, but this is wrought iron. And very rare. You know, I never saw that before. And you can see more of the original color down here. Uh, so there's been cracks in it, and then you know the locks are missing, and I opened it up and there was uh, just grease and a chainsaw in there. And it was just an absolute mess. And um, he said, I gotta get at least a hundred for it. <laughs> now what this gentleman didn't know was that there was this arts and crafts movement going on in the late eight, in the early eighties. And this people were looking for this. So I said, Well, look, um, hundred dollars is a little on the low side, but I, I, you know, I think I think we can do a little bit better for that. So I had a check and I gave him a check for ten thousand dollars. He looks at the check and he says, is this real? <laughs> he said, yeah, that's real. Okay, so he goes back into the house and this is a cabin up in the Adirondack Mountains. And he's, he's in there for a while and, and the, the guy that I was up there with were 
we're cleaning it out, we're gonna bring it in a truck, put it in there, and we're worried now because now two big pickup trucks pull in and it's the kids. And I said, that's it, it's all over. I mean, the kids, they're, they're thinking we're stealing this, we gave them $10,000, it was a great price for the one in this condition. It's horrible condition. So uh, they were in the house for a long time, they came out and I said, look, Deal's over, guys. I, I just wrote a check for 10000 I don't have another check to give you. you know, we're, we're, we're not going to negotiate here. They said, no, we're just waiting. We're just trying to figure out who Dad gave the other one to. <gasps> <laughs> the one that was in the house. Oh, no. well, we don't know exactly where that turned up, but we know where this one went. I took this back to my shop, restored it, refinished it. No, I didn't refinish it. But I remediated the finish. Uh, and it sits in our museum now. And this is a piece that was then brought to the Dallas Museum for the Stickley Revisited show, which was a major exhibit that happened a few years ago. So there it is. Interestingly, the wood is chestnut. And we don't make furniture out of chestnut anymore. Tough to find that stuff. But there's the chestnut wood that Mr. Stickley used in the earliest day. So this is probably one of the very earliest pieces of arts and crafts uh, furniture to have ever been found by Gustav Stickley. So I bring that up to remind us that the furniture that Mr. Stickney made was dramatically different than what was popular just a few years previous. This is what most people wanted in 1900. This in, in the 1880s and the 1870s. This, this was the, what everybody wanted. Soon after though, Gustav Stickney brings up something that's totally different, totally unique, and you know, you really had people who were just born and raised in this going to buy this. And so, you know, they're realizing, wow, this is just amazing stuff. And we just keep going back and forth. I only have two more, two slides. This is it. <laughs> Here, I, I'm gonna share letters with you. Here's the letters. I was watching a program talking about Stickley. I recognized the style. I quickly ran to the desk that my sister and I did homework on that belonged to my great grandparents. Sure enough, there in the bottom of the drawer is a label, and I pulled out the drawer, and I saw written on the back my sister's name, uh, and a boy she fell in love with was scribbled in marker. And there's the Stickley mark right in there. She says, I'm researching Stickley. Purchase two more pieces. I was thrilled to learn that Stickley brothers were born in Osceola, Wisconsin, where my great-grandparents grew up, and, it, and wonder if they were friends of my family. I like to imagine that they were. So see, there's a heritage in Wisconsin with, the, with them. So they, 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 they grew up in, in Osceola, Wisconsin, but they made the five brothers down here at the bottom. Uh, they started a company in Binghamton, New York. That's to the southern tier of New York State, where it's flat, to Pennsylvania. And uh, that was the big area where there's a lot of leather tanning going on there. And uh, a lot of lumber was being cut for that. So the Stickley brothers worked together, and then there were four distinct Stickley furniture companies that emerged from their family. And this is where it gets confusing, because you had Gustav and Leopold working together for a short period of time, but then Leopold left his brother and started a new company in Fayetteville, New York, which is just about 10 miles to the east of Eastwood, New York. And then uh, John George was working with his brother Albert in Grand Rapids as Stickley brothers, but there was only two brothers. And then there was only one brother when John George went to work with Leopold, which meant Leopold and John George, L and J.G. Stickley. And then you had Charles Stickley who stayed with his cousin Skylar Brandt in Binghamton, New York. And that's the confusion. Which brother worked where? This is where a lot of miscommunication comes up when somebody says, I have a Stickley piece. And we have to say, which one? What do you mean, which one? and then you have to give them a lecture because otherwise the chart starts looking something like this and it just gets absolutely crazy. So this is why there's so much interest in all these guys. Now there's a great shot of the factory that we had, we still have, it's part of our museum now, um, <clears throat> where the guys are working, making the arts and crafts furniture. Very dramatic stuff. Look what House Beautiful said in 1902. This new style of ready-made furniture, very comfortable to sit on. Its joints neither come unglued or creak when a stout yokel sits upon it. So there you go, worked out. Top, there he is, he's got his spittoon there, he's got his cigar, he's sitting down. This, this, is, this is what Pop wants to sit down in. He doesn't want that Victorian chair. 
He's ready. These, this is a modern man here. You know, this is not his grand his granddad's furniture. He wanted his own stuff. And and this is this is what happens. Look, scanning through an antiques collectible magazine at a local bookstore, I saw it. Uncle Fred's chair. The article identified it as a stickly, but for me, that picture brought back a flood of memories. As a child, I played with Uncle Fred's poker chips at the foot of the chair. Who played with the poker chips? Come on. There's got to be. You played with the poker chips, right? Everybody did that. I'd snuggle against the scratchy wool vest. We read the comics together. The chair went to a new owner in an estate sale. Now, as an adult, I would love to uh, uh, curl up in the arms of that special chair and relive the warmth of those memories. And are you looking at the name of the furniture company that's up here? Porter Furniture? Mm. You see, we were just talking about your family. And, and they receive. And did you notice that they are also undertakers and embalmers? <laughs> you, you know, you know the you know the furniture store to consumers emerged from undertakers uh, and uh, casket makers. Did you know that? Because the, the the guy who could make the casket had the planers mm -hmm. and he had the machinery to be able to make a tabletop and all the other parts that go to a casket. So casket makers were also the people that you went yeah. to to make your furniture. Or if you had a child and you needed a cradle, you got it from the undertaker. <laughs> Jacobus, Pennsylvania, there was still one up until two years ago. There's actually a big auction going on this week. The Jacobus Furniture and under Undertakers. The building is still there. And that's where the term cradle to grave comes from. That, from that. So you didn't know you were going to learn a lot. We don't like that. We're not two minutes into this. You guys just awesome. So the Morris chair becomes the chair of the arts and crafts movement. This is a chair that had to recline, but it didn't recline automatically. You had to get one of the grandkids to do it for you. If you're and you, that way, you can get, get up and get it. And and they they continue to be great chairs. There's a chair that would have predated, but also continued on. This is a 1908. They were still making. This is the Royal Chair Company in Sturgis, <laughs> Michigan. So there's a Victorian chair with the lions on it. Now, who in their family had a, a lion head chair? Anybody here? You did have one. Did you have one? Yes, sir. Yeah, and when we were kids, we used to stick our finger or get your little niece or little cousin to stick their finger in, in the, because uh, mm -hmm. you know, the lion's going to chop you off. <laughs> So, okay, I don't know if you did that. Uh, did you do that? You would have thought of it. Yeah, you did. Yeah. But so, uh, and that Sturgis, Michigan. So Morris chairs were always these reclining chairs with push buttons. Now, I bring this up. I just did this one for you guys this week, so I'm a, I'm a little rusty on this. I haven't been traveling too much. This is the cover in 1903 that the furniture industry, on the industry uh, magazine, introducing this new style of furniture that was going to replace that heavy carving. This is the image, fashions in furniture. Now I want you to think about fashion, I want you to think about looking good and looking real trendy, and then fashions in furniture, the word mission, and then yes folks, this is what we want your home to look like. This is what you would want to have in your home. I mean, there's something really wrong here because this is not necessarily inviting, although for, for some people it might be, but nevertheless, why did they do this? Why did they do this? So I went to the museum or the library down in North Carolina that has all of these Grand Rapids furniture records. <coughs> and I read articles that predated these. And I saw articles about employees at furniture factories in uh, um, Michigan that were absolutely against this line of furniture. I mean, there, was a, there were strikes going on. This style of furniture initiated factory strikes because the employees, a certain group of employees, didn't like it at all. And you know who that group was? The Carver's Union. And they were, they were boycotting this. So the industry, 
they sided with the carvers and they said, we gotta, make, we gotta kill this stuff right away. And they, and they tried to kill arts and crafts by making it look like uh, ecumenical or maybe for clergy or missions in Southern California. Who would want that? Well, the public kind of saw it a little bit differently. And soon after, as the issues continued on, our arts and crafts got better and better. But to satisfy the carving union, here is the Michigan Share Company's version of that of a, of a, of a mission share. And to get the carvers working, they just basically didn't have a real clue as to what arts and crafts was, but they knew it had something to do with monks and drinking and having fun. So they, they couldn't have the Bible there, and so they had them drinking, popping a couple of beers, and having a good time. So, I mean, the, nobody really got it. The, it. the whole industry was like, what is this stuff? And it really didn't start to connect until Gustav Stickley started to present his styles, and he had a magazine that he promoted his furniture, the Craftsman Magazine. This magazine, which is at the University of Wisconsin's collection, and you can get the digital version on there. This is a May 1908 illustrated monthly magazine edited and published by Gustav Stickley in the interest of better art, better work, and a better, more reasonable way of living. If you ever wanted to define the arts and crafts movement, which was not only furniture, it was textiles, it was pottery, it was art, it was homes, that's it. Better art, better work, and a better, more reasonable way of living. And as I've traveled around the country and I've met people who are passionate about this, I, they get it. And I see it in their homes. I see it when I go into their homes. I see their artwork. I see where they live. I see what they've done with their homes. It's, they, they, figured it, they figured out the philosophy of the movement. So uh, you, you can find this book there on the University of Wisconsin's library. But I wanted to bring this up, Lessons in Cabinet. Now what Gustav Stickley is attempting to do is to educate the customer on his definition of quality. Because it, how, do, how do we define quality furniture? Well, Gustav Stickley said it, you have to look at its construction. How is it joined together? Is it put together in a way that's not gonna fall apart? So that what that meant is mechanical construction. <coughs> not just glue joints, just mortise and tenons, pinned dowel joints, so you actually have a wooden pin being driven right through the mortise. You have pins riding through these mortises. Quadrilinear posts were developed by Leopold Stickley. That's four pieces, individual pieces of quarter sawn oak glued around a central core. Now I'd have to get into a study of wood grains to show you that when you look at a square, of, a solid square of oak, you're gonna get two sides that are flat sawn and two sides that are quarter sawn. So that didn't really look that good. So using the uh, method here with this quadrilinear post gave you the quarter sawn oak on all four sides. So that became a feature of Leopold Stickley. So it was construction at the, at, at, at the foundation, but we had to think about design too. And some other people had some other ideas about design. This man, Harvey Ellis. Ellis is working now for Gustav Stickley. He understands the simplicity. He understands construction, but he also felt that some of the arts and crafts pieces that Stickley was making in the early stages just seemed a little too heavy, too massive, kind of like rooted to the ground. But what does Ellis do? He, he doesn't do the through mortise and tenons with the pin dowel joints. What he does, well, he does the pin dowel joints, but he doesn't do the key tenons or anything like that. But look what he does. This, this is Ellis. This is a, a George Wilkinson, who's working for Gustav Stickney. This is a really great example of early Gustav Stickney. It looks like a rectangular brick. It is rooted to the ground. It's got massive drawer fronts heavy uh, hand hammered copper hardware, nice broad frame around the central field, and a nice uh, 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 a cabinet bank here. Beautiful, it is gorgeous arts and crafts, very well done, early Gustav Stickley. <coughs> Harvey Ellis comes along, he interprets this type of desk as this piece. 
and look at the difference between those objects. Starting at the bottom, look at the arch. What's it doing? It's raising the piece up. It's almost like it's weightless. It's lifting it, you see? And then that open space there at the bottom is giving an opportunity for maybe a basket or some such a decorative arts. Oh, Middleton. It's not Mequon. 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 Do you know Mequon? How do you know Mequon? Do you live there? No. Oh, okay. It's a famous town? It's nearby. Okay. Oh, good. I don't know. It must, it must, when I was looking at the map, I must have remembered it. But this is Middleton. And the cool part about this development is every home is an arts and crafts home, but they're all different. Every home is different, which is kind of neat. So I, I love that. So when I went up and visited that, I saw that, and it was great to go see what people had done. So there's a lot of different books on this. David's book, Alex Burdikoff's book, and Ray's book. And Ray and I used to uh, drive around the White Plains, New York, and we would drive around pointing at houses. Oh, there's one, there's one, there's one. And it was one house we stopped and we saw a lighting fixture, a lantern up in the, in the uh, porch. <laughs> and we must have stayed there for too long, pointing at this thing and looking at it because the police pulled up behind us. And the guy comes out of the door and he comes over to the police. These guys have been here for like 15 minutes pointing at my house. And we told him who we were and you know, we were able to get away with it. He ended up selling it. He had no idea what it was. No idea, $10,000, boom, happy to sell it. You know, that's, that, that was happening in the, in the late 70s and the early 80s. Now you know uh, that there is an official car of the arts and crafts movement today, do you know that? No? Well, there is. I see it everywhere. I don't care whether I'm in Wisconsin, or up in the South, or I'm in California. When I see arts and crafts homes, I see vintage Volvos. There, who, does anybody have a vintage Volvo? Am I the only one? <laughs> no, really? Look at, look at this. There they are. Except for the minivan there. That's in Sacramento. And then I get a call from the guy who owns the only Gustav Stickley home in, a, in, a, in uh, that's, that is in the magazine that has been found, and it's in Portland, Oregon. So I drive up to Portland, Oregon. I pull up to the house. The Gilliard House, and what's out front? Of course, <laughs> wonderful little Volvo. <laughs> okay, so aren't these rooms great? This is not. It's not the this is not your grandmother's the Victorian home. Forest. This is a modern home. This is modern. Thank you for coming. And I, I know why you guys are leaving, and it's okay. Yeah, because we've have talked a about practice. <laughs> yes, we've talked about that. Blessings on you guys. It's nice to talk to you, and you already learned a lot already. That's pretty cool. So look, this, this is modernism. We look, we're looking back on it, many of us think antique, but to a person who came out of the Victorian period, this is American modernism. And we can see where American modernism has its foundation in America, in the arts and crafts movement, which is why arts and crafts work so well with American modernism. Now, this subject I wanted to bring up. After purchasing a 1910 craftsman home, I worked hard to furnish it in stickly furniture in the mission style. Recently, my mother visited and commented on the handsome furniture. I, of course, told her it was stickly, and she said, it reminds me of that old stick bed that you boys used to fight over. You know it had part of a sticker on it that said stick with the rest torn away? And that's how it got the name, the stick bed. And I, as I looked at her dumbfounded, she said, maybe that's where your obsession with this type of furniture began. So this is a... Uh, beginning of the whole idea of arts and crafts and labels and marks. Now this mark is probably one of the earliest marks you'd ever see with a Stickley name on it, and that's Stickley and Brandt, and that's Binghamton, New York. And this is the style of furniture that they began making. Why were they making this? It's what people wanted. And they had a furniture factory, and you know, if you want to stay in business, you better be making what people want. So this is the earliest uh, label that you would see. But the Gustav Stickley label, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but just there are Gustav Stickley labels with the joiner's compass and the words all zik khan, that's Flemish for all I can, or loosely translated to the, re to the best of my ability. There's paper labels too. And then there's the Onondaga shops. That's the name of the county where we live in, where Fayetteville is. And then there's the hand clamp 
by Ellen J.G. Stickney. And then there's the work of Ellen J.G. Stickney, the burned in mark and the metal labels. And the same with Albert Stickley in Grand Rapids. He's got decals, he's got metal labels, he's got different burned in marks. And then there's, Al, there's Charles Stickley with his labels and his brands. So when somebody says, I've got a piece of Stickley and it's got a mark on it, you gotta say what? Which one? Because they're, you got these four different companies and these five different brothers. And all of these have their, there's certain objects from each one of these brothers that are just wonderful. But of course, Gustav Stickley gets the most credit for a lot of things. But when you see somebody point out something like this suite of uh, kind of period style painted furniture, and it's got Stickley Brothers Grand Rapids, this is more of a 1930s look. It kind of was a commercial kind of a look. So not everything that's branded Stickley has market value. Uh, and of course, things like that can change too. And then I was in Pasadena and we were doing the road show there and somebody said, oh, I've got these two stickly chairs. They both came to my grandparents. One of them has a stickly mark and one of them doesn't. And you can see where that one is there on the left side. And you can just see it, it says the work of Ellen J.G. Stickley. And they looked and they said, well, it's not there. I said, well, have you tried turning the chair upside down and looking under the arm, which you would see right here. And there is an earlier version of the, of the chair. Uh, so the work of Ellen J.G. Stickley mark there. So you gotta kind of look all over. So when people say, well, where do I look for the brand? They weren't really fastidious about making sure they always got in the same spot, even within the same object. So you gotta kind of look all over the place. And then when this one came out, and this one came out of Michigan, and this was in pieces by the time it came to us uh, at, one of our, at one of the road shows, and it, you can see a very, very faint label here Toby Furniture Company, who Gustav Stickley marketed this piece of furniture to. And I said, what's the story with this? They said, well, I'm sorry it fell apart, but it was all in pieces anyways, and we were gonna throw it into the fire up at camp, but we heard you were coming, so we thought we'd take a look at it. I said, well, do you, do you have any idea what this is? And they said, we really don't. And I said, well, look, I'm glad you brought it in. Uh, let's see if we can market this for you. For you. So in the condition that it was in, it was a $20,000 table in the condition that it was in. Had it been in excellent original condition, we would have been up into the eighty to $90,000 level. But they were happy. They got more than they would have if they burned it, BTU-wise. So that was pretty neat. And then there was this one where the guy says, oh, I got a stickly piece. Nobody's ever seen this one before. And they said, well, why don't you send me a picture? And so this is what he sends me a picture of. Nobody ever saw this design before. No. Nobody else was bidding on it. There's another reason to stay away. And then he said, it's got an undocumented shot mark. Bonk, three out, three strikes, you're out. He honestly thought that this was a stickly mark. You know, somebody just did a Dremel tour and just carved stickly in there. You know, but I got it cheap, I got it for $45. I said, well, you paid about $45 too much. Uh, but it, these are the kinds of things that sometimes happen here. And then if you ever see something like this, this is leather with gold tooling. And this is after Stickley Brothers went out of business and they were bought by the, the, uh, the uh, Western Table Company of Selma, Alabama. And they just decided to use the Stickley brand because, hey, we're in the Stickley factory. We just bought it up in Grand Rapids. We'll call it Stickley. So it was called the Stickley line, but it has nothing to do with the Stickley Brothers. So watch out for stuff like that. And then there's things that, that are like this. When we're doing road shows around the country and I'm, down in, I'm out in Phoenix, and the gal comes up and she says, you know, I was looking at your, your show. I think I have a chair that looks something like the chairs you guys are ta you're talking about. And I said, well, what, what, what is it you're talking about? And they said, um, she says, well, I, I said, where is it? Is it here in Phoenix? She says, no, it's not here in Phoenix. I said, well, where? She says, it's on the East Coast. I said, well, I live on the East Coast. Where? She says, well, it's in New York. I, I said, well, I, I live in New York. She said, no, it's not New York City. It's upstate New York. I said, well, I live in upstate New York. Where is it? She said, it's near Syracuse. I live near Syria. I'm, where? She was a little town. It's just out. It's called Liverpool. It's near Liverpool. I said, I live near Liverpool. What's the village? She said, Galville. I live in Galville. I'm in Phoenix. She's telling me about a chair that her father and mother has, and the dad took it out of a barn when he was working on the barn. The guy gave it to him, and she says, and so, so I said, well, look, let me, 
Let me drive the whole two miles away from my house and go visit your mom and dad. And there we were, and there's the chair. And you see the inlay needs a little bit of work, little work on there, needs to be remediated. I'm showing this for two reasons. Number one, I want you to notice how the medullary rays, that's what you call those, some people call them, the kids call them gummy worms. But that's the medullary ray. That's, that's a, it's kind of like a, it's, it's the membrane, if you will, of the wood grain that doesn't take stain very well. But if you do a certain thing to the wood, you can make it look dark like this. And collectors are looking for that because it proves that the finish was fumed with ammonia. So that means that this is original finish, it's great shape, it's excellent. And they ended up $90,000 for this piece of furniture. So it worked out great. So this is my shop in the museum. I work on various objects uh, in the museum and then we do these little talks too on restoring and things like that. Maybe we'll do some of these. But I'm trying to get those online these days simply because I'm kind of getting tired of lugging this stuff around. So if you stay, stay tight with us and we'll be showing more and more things online. But the, uh, this is why things like this happen at the Roadshow. Ready? Okay, here it is. Here's, here's the conversation. My husband would finish the stickly table. Oh, did you know we played bluegrass music together in upstate New York? So I played fiddle. Now, we played in different bands, but we played in the same bars. But this is when we were all in school, Mohawk Valley Community College in Morrisville. Okay, here's the, there you go. Husband finished the table, and the appraiser says, oh, too bad, uh -huh, too bad. And then he's all ticked off, because what did he do? <laughs> He removed the original finish, and that's, he removed the effect of the fuming. See, but he made it look like, like the Klee, look at the Klee lights on there, it's shining, boy. That's great, so, so, uh, th so that's why original finish is so important. And now I wanna show you something really interesting, too. Remember what would I it have been if it were in original condition? Oh, that table? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know how many head leaves that had. Uh, good tip. Back then, it was about fifteen thousand in original condition. Maybe they're common. Let me stay with this. Do you notice the difference in the ray flake? Now that you know that that's what that is, ray flake. Do you notice the difference in the color tone? Do you notice how this is white because it didn't take the stain, right? And you notice how this is dark because it was fumed <coughs> with ammonia. And that's what Gustav Stickley was looking for. This is just a Grand Rapids piece. It's all, it's all veneer. Quarter sawing veneer was very popular back then. And, and be, being able to get all this medullary ray like this and matching, notice how that matches itself and how the front rail is, is got quarter sawn and the top has quarter sawn. You can't do that without veneering. So this is what the industry was doing. And a lot of people like that. Gustav Stickley said no. He said because this, it, 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 it goes contrary to the simple form of the object. He wanted the simplicity of the line and the form of the object to be paramount in the, in the object's design. And he thought, and rightly so in many instances, where the, too much of that ray flake it got too busy. See, so he, he's looking to darken it. Now, how do you do that? So let me, you, you fume it with ammonia. And, and, here, and here's a Gustav Stickley uh, piece that's got that, all that dark finish. And so let me tell you what happened. I, find, I found this letter. We had found, somebody told us of a house up in upstate New York that was being knocked down at a hospital <coughs> parking lot. So we got word of it uh, uh, and we drove up took a look at it, instantly recognized this as a sickly home. It was going to be knocked down. There was no doubt about it to them. We said, look, we will pay you to take the content. We, we just want the wood. We want to get everything out of here. So we bought the, the rights to take the house apart. There were chandeliers. There were bookcases. There was hardware underneath the, underneath the staircase in the little cubby under the door, stickly copper hooks. There was a stickly doorknob, in, interior, exterior doorknobs with keys. 
were pulling out all of the build-ins, all of the wood. There was um, plywood against the fireplace. I pulled the fire. I pulled the, the, the plywood out. Stickly and irons and fireplace tools made of iron, all hand hammered were in there. So we pulled the baseboards out, and there was a letter in a craftsman envelope. And I opened it up. Here's the letter. In the case of our craftsman houses, we find it easier to fume chestnut woodwork than to stain it. This process is the more to be recommended because chestnut takes the fumes of ammonia very quickly and easily. How many of you have ever opened some Mr. Clean and just taken a good deep whiff and lived? <laughs> right. you know, that's, that's kind of what we're dealing with. You know. So this is, this, was the, this is the ammonia fuming. The letter goes on. It says, uh, fuming the interior woodwork, fairly good substitute for an airtight compartment, may be obtained by shutting up the room in which the woodwork is to be fumed, stuffing up all the crevices, and then setting around the floor a liberal number of dishes into which a very strong aqua ammonia, 26% solution, is quickly poured. The person who pours the ammonia will find it necessary to get out of the room as quickly <laughs> as possible after the fumes are released. There you go. Imagine this coming out in the mail to you today. I mean, this was okay. It was okay. You know, they, they live, I think. <laughs> how long until it got dark? You know, it just depended how much. Yeah, no, I well, I'll tell you. I, as far as the interior of a home, I've never done a home. These are the fuming rooms in the factory. Now, when we got there, the fuming was long gone, but we we knew this is the storage room for the dowels and the screws and all the parts because the guys had stopped using fuming a long time. But there is the, there's the mechanism that pumped the ammonia from the basement. And then there's the big doors and there's stickly labels. You can't see the stickly labels on the door, but open the door, come inside. And here is where the fume, this is where the ammonia was, was uh, poured. And you would leave this in here and then the furniture would get put in here. These were, these were built later on uh, just for storage. But and you can see how dark the, the rooms got in there. So there, there's the fumy rooms, folks. And uh, this is the kind of thing that they, they fumed with. And this is something that when we reissued Mission Oak, we had to look and say, well, geez, can we do this again? You know, so we called OSHA. And uh, they, they called right back. As a matter of fact, they came over. <laughs> and no, you cannot fume in an environment like we're doing today. So some of my buddies, they, they like to take and they rent U-Haul trucks. And they rent a U-Haul truck for a, for a week or so. They put their furniture in there and they, and then they bring the U-Haul truck back. Right. Come on, man, you're really doing that? I can't, I can't believe that they do that. So, and this is our ghost, one of our ghosts. We have a few ghosts in the factory. Can you see his face there? Like the face on the bar room floor up there in, cent, in cent, center, central, center City, Colorado, Central City. He's saying, don't fume. Yeah, we've got a few different ghosts up there. You liking this? You having fun? Because I am, because I haven't seen these in a while. All right, I'm not done just yet, Mom. But, okay, sorry. <laughs> Truth which one man finds courage to utter today is echoed and applied by thousands tomorrow. That's pretty cool. And look at that, we're living that. We're living this. And, and, and we take this very, very seriously. I mean, the pieces of furniture that we're trying to make, we don't want to go bankrupt. Gustav Stickley went bankrupt. You know why he went bankrupt? He didn't want to change styles. When he saw that the tastes were changing, he didn't get into it. And as a result, the company went bankrupt. Now, I think about the guys working in the factory, you know? And that's, why should they suffer for the fact that Gus wouldn't change anything? So interestingly, Gus goes bankrupt. His brother Leopold and John George buy the company and they keep everybody working. They turned it into a chair factory. So the factory kept going. So they're now, both Stickley factories are now being run by Leopold Stickley. But you know, Gus and the, and the, and the marks and the decals and the brands, now the joiner's compass and the Hand clamp, they're together, you see, because the brothers got together. But you gotta give Gus a lot of credit. Watch out for this, guys. This was the last decal, watch out for that. When I say that many of these were found 
in the old factory, and over the decades, many people have gotten themselves in there and taken them. And when I say thousands, yeah, there's thousands of these out there. And unfortunately, some people take them and put them on pieces of furniture that they shouldn't put them on. And then you look at it and say, oh, look, it's got the stickly mark. I'll send it to the historian, and he'll tell me that it's right, and I have to say it's wrong. So watch out for that, okay? So let's give Gus a hand. I mean, because he didn't get a hand when he went bankrupt. So let's give him a hand. Thank you, Gus. You knew it. Thanks to Gus. It's just astounding. And the fam their family is wonderful, and, and, and there's a lot of good stuff going on. Leopold Stickley, here's his factory. And I want to bring this up because I haven't talked about the Prairie School. And of course, I had to bring it up because I'm up here in Wisconsin. I'm going to go to a couple Frank Lloyd Wright houses tomorrow. And I see, do you see Prairie School in this? Yeah, easily. And this was, this was um, Peter Hansen, a guy, that, well, this is, this is Leopold Stickley, but Peter Hansen was hired by Leopold Stickley, and he was from Wisconsin. And he came to the factory in 1905 and started designing furniture for Leopold Stickley. That's an awesome piece of furniture. There's a, there's a, there's a, this is now our town life, a whole lecture, every one of those rooms, and I'm not gonna do that to you tonight. I just want you to notice though, when arts and crafts furniture really started hitting the skids is when the mass market started making it. And for $39.98, you used to get a whole four piece mission finished library suite where one stately chair was, was 30 bucks. So the low end of the market could make things that looked like stickly, but make it out of red oak and not quarter sawn oak or not white oak. They can, they can make it look like it without the right joinery, and that's why there's so much junky arts and crafts furniture that's out there, and people, oh, look, it's just like Stickley. Well, it's not just like Stickley. But the Stickleys had to deal with the low end because their stuff was expensive, and a lot of people didn't understand why. Do you think we still have the same problem? Yeah. I mean, people look at the price of our furniture, they go, are you kidding? We go, well, no, we're not kidding. You have to look at how we're making it. And some people want to understand that, and some people don't want to understand it. But that's the way it goes. <laughs> now, you would have thought that that was the end. But you've got to find out what happens in between. And very quickly, the market started to change. After World War I, guys coming back from war wanted to emulate the European homes, or European designs. That was one wing, and then on the other wing, they came back hearkening back to early American styles. The Metropolitan Museum of Art opened the early American wing in 1926. Tens of thousands of people went to the Met, and they went to see this new uh, display of colonial American furniture. So Leopold Stickley had collected antiques from the region in upstate New York called the Cherry Valley. And it was the Cherry Valley Turnpike, which was the, the, the Revolutionary War Trail from Albany to Buffalo. And then, of course, there was the Erie Canal as well. So Leopold Stickley starts designing objects based on those collections. They're very successful. Stores all around the country purchased it. Marshall Fields in Chicago, 1933. Marshall Fields. Does that ring a bell with you guys? Yeah? Your, your name is not Fields, is it? I was just double checking. Stickley House. Look at this. Look at the eight, look at the rooms filled with Stickley's furniture. They had, the, they had the staff dress in period costume. Where's the staff? You guys should dress up in arts and crafts costume. You should do that. But look, there's an interesting thing. Look, pinned mortise and tenons. See, tongue and groove glue joints. Construction elements from arts and crafts made it into this line of furniture because the DNA at Stickley, at Stickley Design was construction. So even though it doesn't look like arts and crafts, it's built like it. So there are people who are collecting this today. In the 1950s, there was a book called A Developing Furniture Style. This book was presented to people who wanted to buy it. This is the Jenny Jerome chest. This was found in Casanova, New York, a really wonderful little upstate New York community. I met the woman who owned it originally from the Jerome family. Jenny Jerome was Winston Churchill's mother. And this came from their estate. And so Mr. Stickley is presenting these objects as, as 
reissues of American antiquities with stories. And he talked about the stories and then he talked about construction. See, the construction story is woven into the Stickley product. And you may not necessarily see it each time, every time, all the time, because we, we do a really a lot of good a blind mortise and tendons sometimes in the side of drawer guys. But as a result of Mr. Stickley's uh, uh, work, and here he is, he's getting an award, Leopold Stickley, revered dean of cabinet makers, and this is in 1955, uh, whose art and craftsmanship have contributed mightily to American home life. Here he is, right here. Okay, oh, well, you got a picture? Okay, uh, and unfortunately he died the year after, and this is the factory just shortly after that, and uh, this is part of our museum. My workshop is right on the other side, that way, and the construction features, and Mrs. Stickley standing here at the factory. So when, and then what happened was, Mr. Stickley here passes away, and Alfred Audi's father, who is standing right here, he is not, he was Leopold's closest friend and associate. He had his furniture store in New York City, which is why the Audis own the company now. Now there's Leopold Stickley, the last surviving brother, sitting right next to him at the birthday party is Alfred, is E.J. Audi. He's the only other guy in that room with a red carnation. And sitting right across the table is an 18 year old Alfred Audi, who was a university student up in upstate New York who came to the party, and he's sitting right across the table from his dad. So there's the current owner of the Stickley Furniture Company right there. there there's no, there was no other family members. If Mrs. Stickley had passed away and the company had gone to some conglomerate or some industry, you would never have what we have today. Alfred listened to his father give the speech that day. We have a copy of the speech. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So when we talk about how the, the Stickley Audi connection, it is a very, very strong connection. So he buys the company, the employees who started working. Tony DeMichael was my first foreman. Carmen Massey, his wife had a fish store with my mother. Joe Bastone went to school with my mother. I mean, there's Mr. Audi, Steve Cimino, Leo Modell. These guys were the ones who kept the company going when Mr. Audi bought it and they decided to stay. So what happened was, all those guys have passed away. We were the first, there's the first five guys. We're all still there. I mean, we're all still working at the factory. We all have unique jobs with the company. And this is a picture taken uh, a week before Mr. Audi passed away. Uh, and we, we miss him tremendously. But a legacy, deserve, his legacy deserves that round of applause. I mean, little pieces of American history going on here. It's, it's just astounding. Did they buy a vibrant, healthy furniture factory? Nope. Dilapidated building, older employees, ready to retire. He wants to revive it. First thing he does, he has to hire young people. He hired a bunch of us local guys. We started making furniture. Were we making mission furniture? No. We were making the colonial furniture. The cherry colonial. Because when Mr. Audi opened up the office and looked at the orders, they were all for Windsor chairs and trestle tables. I mean, so you're gonna build that. So we had the drawings, we had the old machinery, tongue and groove glue joint machine from the 1920s, we still had that machine. So we tongue and groove every board. We still tongue and groove every board. We still have this machine. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about construction, I'm telling you there was a passion with the Audi family originally to make sure that if anybody compared old and new Stickley in the cherry, in the colonial line, they wanted to make sure that people knew that he didn't change anything. Well, obviously we didn't change anything and people started buying our furniture. We bought our, our truck and this, we got this good deal on this truck, I think $50 from a guy named Isidore Rapsadi who owned the onion farm in Canastota, New York. And uh, the reason we got it so cheap was because it smelled like onions and we, we had a hard time delivering furniture without that smell because we would go in and people would say, what's that smell? And I'd say, it's the finish. And uh, I, it was our early fuming. And you see with the, with the fire up there in the 1960s, there's, there's our great factory right there. And, and I, I gotta talk to you about this. This cherry colonial furniture 
it's going to be an American collectible. It's, it's, it's going to happen. And I see this kind of stuff on eBay, but the way people describe it is just bizarre to me. But I shouldn't be surprised. How do people describe quality furniture? Very solid. I like that. Extremely heavy. Incredibly heavy. And great weight. It's like we should be making lead drawer bottoms or something. No, oh, it's heavy. It's heavy. And you hear people say that. It's got to be it's heavy. That's not the way you judge fine quality. You judge it through construction and design. Mr. Audi hired Bill DeBlay, fantastic designer, to make this beautiful furniture in 18th century design in the, in, the, in, the early, in the early 80s. The reason we were designing like this was because people were watching Dallas and Dynasty on TV. And this is what they wanted. And Bill was a designer for Colonial Williamsburg years ago. Kittens, your furniture company. He comes to work for us. And we're making these beautiful pieces. And we're using things like Peter Morris and Tenons and the later side and center home drawer guide. So you gotta realize there's a DNA that's in us. And we don't want to make furniture differently than what the way other people do. Er, uh, Earl Luce was the boiler man. Earl ate garlic all day long. So you always knew where Earl was. It was an amazing thing. So Earl, would, he'd always get us working down there once in a while. So down in the basement, up in the attic, here and there, the fire marshals came in shortly after Mr. Audi bought the company. And the fire marshals up in the attic, they put a report in, all this junk's got to be removed. There was this, uh, so we pull all the stuff out of the attic. Then, then they go down underneath, underneath the factory, there's a chaseway that's got all of, the, all of the, uh, the mechanics for the machinery and the belts and all that stuff. So the fire marshal said, everything's gotta be taken out of there. So I was the skinny kid who could get in there and I'm pulling this stuff out and I'm tossing it out to the back of the guys. And these guys are going, hey, what is it? What's this? And I says, I can't even see anything, let alone, I don't know. What. So we pull out these old drawings and these old catalogs of this furniture and Earl goes, oh, that's the old stuff. And he's gonna burn it. And I said, Earl, this is cool. We can't burn this stuff. He said, well, don't let the fire marshal see it. So I put it all back up in the attic because the fire marshal had already okayed the attic. So up it went to the attic and that's where it stayed. And it stayed there until around 1985, 86, when we started to get some phone calls and people started to say, are you the Stickleys that make the mission furniture? Are you, are you that company? We'd say, well, yeah, we are, but we, you know, we don't have it anymore. We come and see the factory, and they come and see the factory, and then they'd say, do you have any old stuff? And we'd show them what we had, and their, their eyes are bugging out. Original drawings, original catalogs. And this is David Cathers and Alex Vertikoff and Stephen Gray and all these early collectors. They said, this is like this is like the mother load here. So that was enough for us, and we worked with them to get pieces of furniture, and we started to reissue the collection based on these drawings and pieces that were given to us by collectors. So the spindle chair, very desirable piece. Before it went to Barbara Streisand, it came to us. And we were able to draw these things out and we were able to show how we were gonna do the quadrilinear post. And the quadrilinear post was done by Leopold Stickley. It was not done by Gustav Stickley. So if we wanted to make a Gust, this is the way Gustav Stickley did it. Gus did a, Gus did a veneer with two pieces of wood glued together. That was Gus's post. This is Leopold's post. So now we had this excellent opportunity to design or reissue the Gustav Stickley 208 settle with Leopold's construction feature, which was better. And you see what we did? We made an irreversible construction variation. So we redesigned it, but we didn't make any visual difference. We made a construction variation and we improved on Gus's pieces. So when we say that we are making furniture better than the original design and construction, this is what we're talking about. That's it. Quarter sawn oak, rift sawn oak. I mean, there's differences in that, but we know that Gus had some quarter sawn. He had some rift sawn. And most, we try to get as much quarter sawn as we can. Uh, it's really difficult to do that. Every once in a while, we'll get, we, I mean, we certainly don't use plain sawn. But every once in a while, we'll, we'll have somebody who wants all five inch, boards and we'll do it as a special but you know you, we can't do every single piece that way um, it's very unusual 
this uh, we this is a couple who searched for years looking for pieces that were both designed well and constructed to last. After a futile search, which included custom builders, I mentioned to a coworker that the current builders either lacked the design strengths of the originals or the construction quality that could last a lifetime. And now they're 45 pieces and they're, and they're still buying furniture. So we're grateful. And when I tell people we're making it better, just look at the originals. That's an original Gustav Stickley drawer. It's got a center guide that's screwed into place. It's got a plywood drawer bottom, necessarily plywood. I wouldn't want to have to use solid there because too much movement could happen. But take a look at what's happened to the drawer. It's scraping on the cross rail because it's, that's where its support is. Well, when we reissued it, we did it with the later Cherry Valley construction, side hung drawer guides. So the weight of the drawer is now suspended on the side guides and that means that the drawer never touches bottom. And then there's also the dovetail cross rails, which the originals didn't have. So these are the kinds of things that you're paying for when you buy our furniture. So old has its place, the new has its place. And many people are proud to put the pieces together, old and new. And it's very, very difficult to find a lot of old pieces these days, and we were very happy to do that. So the dovetail cross rail is the one where we, this is where we had to hide this. See, this is a colonial feature where you're exposing the dovetail. And when you look at the posts of the mission pieces, how were they done? There's an original Gustav Stickley chest with a dowel. It's a dowel joint. The glue has failed. The glue's going to pop out. That's why the piece is racking a little bit. It has to be restored. We now are gonna reissue this piece. Are we gonna reissue it with the dowel? No, we're gonna reissue it with a dovetail. But how do you put a dovetail here when you have the post that is offsetting the rail? You use what's known as a blind dovetail. So you use the blind dovetail, and as a result, you've got the great look without the dovetail, but you got better construction. So I guess I'm coming to an end because I figured this is about the end of it, but we do make more than just arts and crafts furniture. And the more we come up with new ideas, the more people seem to like them. We have our Leopold's chair coming soon to a home near you <laughs> in black velvet, no less. <laughs> it's going to be great. And uh, the gathering islands, which are just pretty cool that we came up with a few years back. So this, this happened because we're all standing around watching a football game and everybody's standing behind the couch and we had nowhere to put our beers. <laughs> well, this looks good. See, there's the beer. You can put the beer right there. You can do that. And, the, and our beautiful weather. So folks, uh, I, I'm grateful. I, it's too late to tell this story. Um, I got, I'll finish with this one. Of Calgary, Alberta, Laura Thistle. Living in Calgary, Alberta, my husband has become a very avid fly fisherman. My husband decided he wanted a fly tying table but where would we put such an unattractive item? A few weeks later, a stickly flyer uh, came in the mail. We, we thought the Harvey Ellis desk with deck was the perfect choice. That's a beautiful piece of furniture, sits in our living room. Uh, Cubby scores everything, stores everything uh, he needs neatly in an organized, this is not their living room, by the way. Um, this is just a <laughs> shot. A bonus for us is that the desk has turned out to be a great family gathering place where all three of our girls will tie the flies pleasure of it. She wrote this letter and I wrote her back and she said, she says, I'm, I, I'm really trying to get the girls not to scratch the furniture because they're using the hooks and, and you can see she's, there's the pictures and she was really proud of it. So what can I do to keep them from doing that? Should I put a piece of glass on the top or something? And I wrote her back and I said, you know, Laura, what I'm looking at here is a family moment and a story. And I think what you should do is simply paste wax the top just just to make sure that you, you're giving a little bit of protection but I don't think I would remove those marks I, I think I would keep them there because that's a story and when your kids grow up they're gonna tell that story and they're gonna show it to their kids and I went to Calgary and I visited them and it was beautiful and it was very very wonderful uh, three years ago I went back to visit Laura and her husband said Mike she's passed away and she had cancer and she passed on and she died and the girls they walked over to the table and they just, they run their hand on it. 
He says, Mom always took care of us. Mm -hmm. I mean, you understand, see, some of the stuff that goes on in our brains sometimes when we're at the shop and we're hearing stories like this and you make awesome furniture that's gonna pass on from generation to generation, that's where we're at. And that's, that's why we're still working. And that's why you guys are keeping us working. So we're in the shop, we're in the factory, we're making things. Yes, we have modern equipment. Yes, we have new routers. Yes, we have new planers. Yes, we have some, some five axis router. I mean, this is all, we need to have this. Gustav Stickley had new machinery too. Gustav Stickley had a 19, not 1867 Clement bandsaw in his factory. All right, that was a cool, ever seen one? Made in Rochester, New York. I haven't seen many either. I got a phone call from a guy. He says, I got this Clement bandsaw and the guy I bought it from says it came out of the Stickley factory. I said, what are you talking about? It's 34 inch Clement bandsaw, I looked at the date. The factory was sold in 1966 and there was an auction. All the contents gone. The guy on the phone is claiming that he bought it from the guy who bought it at the auction in 1966. I went back to the auction list. There it is, Clement Bandsaw, 34 inch, boom. I says, I gotta come and see this thing. And so I'm talking to him on the phone. I says, is, is this Chuck Miley? And he goes, is this Mike Daniel? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah. He says, Chuck, how did you get this? And he told me the whole story. So I went to the house, I bought it. It's in my workshop now. <laughs> so, you know the pleasure I have cutting on that bandsaw that was in Gustav Stickley's factory? Machinery is wonderful, but machinery is nothing without great finishing. And we're still doing hand finishing like this on our furniture. And some of the traditional pieces with the hand rubbing, we still do this. Like the old guys, look at these guys. Man, good memory. We still, we still do this kind of work. See, when the old guys die, we just get new guys. <laughs> yeah, <that works. laughs> you guys, you have been wonderful. There were like three, three times during my talk where I said, I'll stop if I see that you guys are, are getting a little antsy. And then I realized we're not in New York. <laughs> We're in Wisconsin. You guys like stories. Thanks for listening to mine. Thank you.